disciplines can be within a single topic. The dynamic sessions challenge students with innovative ideas, and the entire campus community participates in the events and learns together. This year's symposium is based on the topic, the languages of life. For two days, we will engage with experts who will help us understand the languages of our lives and spur us to think carefully about how we choose to communicate with those around us. It will highlight the importance of values, character, lifelong learning, and problem solving, all key components of a liberal arts education. It is my honor to introduce the speakers of our first plenary session today, titled The Value of Language. David Peterson is a language creator and author. David is best known for having created the Dothraki and High Valyrian language on HBO's Game of Thrones and House of the Dragon. Since then, he has gone on to create languages to many television series and films, including Sci-Fi's Defiance, Netflix The Witcher, Legendary's Dune, and the CW's The 100. He's the author of the book, The Art of Language Invention, and he's the creator of Duolingo High Valyrian course. He received a bachelor's degree in linguistics from UC Berkeley and a master's from UC San Diego. Jesse Sams has a PhD in linguistics from the University of Colorado at Boulder and was a professor of linguistics at Stephen F. Austin State University for 13 years where she designed a language creation course. She's now a full-time professional co-langer co and works with her partner, David Peterson. Her work appears in TV shows and films, including Netflix, Shadow and Bone, Pixar's Elemental, Peacock's Vampire Academy, um, Freeform's Motherland for Salem. With David, she co-hosts the weekly live stream Lang Ta Lang Time Studio on YouTube, where they create new languages from scratch and share the process. Uh, again, on behalf of the symposium committee, we welcome you again, and we hope you have a great experience these two days. Please welcome our speakers. All right, so hold on a sec. Okay, good, my mic is up. Jesse, is yours up? I hope so. Okay. Uh, and when you said you wanted the left side, did you mean stage left? I did mean stage left. left. I did mean Excellent. stage left. Yeah, we're okay. all good. How many people are still asleep right now? <laughs> we're with you. We're, we're, we're here to wake you up, by which I mean Jesse is. Go for it. <laughs> Sorry, what? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, we, I start? Yeah, yeah, you're starting. Uh, I thought you'd do the title slides. The value oh of language. Oh my goodness, you're right. Wait, is that, no, that's your name. Now, value of language, Jesse Sams. <laughs> All right, so let's say you're on the phone with a friend. I feel like I'm very loud and squeaky, I'm trying to get away from the feedback here. I think he's working on it. All right, so let's say you're on the phone with a friend and are looking at a page with three pictures. Now, on the phone, your friend obviously can't see the photos. And so you need to describe them. So my question to you is just think about what details, how would you describe these three images, some of which may seem very familiar, uh, to your friend on the phone. Just kind of stare at those, nice little collage. All right, so as you're thinking about that, we're gonna talk about what details you focused on or maybe what details you didn't focus on. So in these three photos, we've got the brick district up top, which we visited last night, very lovely area. 
We've got some students from Westminster, and then we have a collage of alumni over there. Now, whether or not you knew they were alumni, you've got a collage of photos of a lot of people, uh, some of whom are bearing Westminster things. Uh, but let's look more closely at each photo. So this is the, the downtown brick district, and yet in it, a lot of people would probably describe the buildings, the streets, the cars, maybe the lamps, maybe even the beautiful Christmas decorations. They look very lovely. But did any of you focus on the words in the image? And all of these circled are legible words. Now, of course, you're far enough back that maybe bank is the only one that's super legible. But we've got a stop sign, we've got a street sign, we've got signs about parking, we've got signs about how to get to the Chamber of Commerce, we've got pizza parlor information on the windows. All of these circled areas represent areas where there's written language that even if you had the photo up close, probably wouldn't have spent a lot of time describing those particular details. In the image of the students up here, which by the way, it'd be really awesome if any of these students were actually here in the audience. If you are, shout out, great picture. Uh, but on their shirts, you may have said there's a group of students, but did you, did you describe all the different ways that Westminster and the Blue Jays are being represented here on the t-shirts? Same for the collage of the alumni. We've got a lot of instances of written language in the background. We've got posters, we've got name tags, had to be circled in yellow because her dress did not allow the pink to show up. Uh, we've got writing on shirts. We've got um, writing on the, the banners, not the banners, the robe things on the graduation robes. Uh, we've got writing all over there. Um, and these are only static images with written text and you could see how much was circled just from those images. But now think of all the spoken language you encounter on a daily basis. Just walking down the street and you hear people chatting, uh, you know, radio going, songs playing. This is normal background noise of our life. Language is all around us, so much so that we often forget that it's there. And so we often end up taking it for granted and forgetting its power. Language has become sort of a part of our background noise that creates our system of beliefs about the world and how it works. And that means everyone carries biases and assumptions about language because it is part of our kind of larger operating system. There are a lot of uh, misconceptions that surround uh, language, some of which are quite common, some of which you heard before, some of which I'm sure all of us thought at one point in time. Uh, you know, for example, nice common one, they don't speak English, so I need to speak louder and slower for them to understand me. Of course, that, that's false. All, on, though, on the other hand, if somebody does speak a little bit of English, speaking slower does help. And, in fact, if somebody speaks a language that you've only studied a little bit, slower also does help. We were just in Finland, I can attest to that. Um, American Sign Language isn't a real language. It's like miming English, absolutely false. And not only is American Sign Language a real language that has a full glam grammar, there are actually different sign languages all over the world that are not related to one another. And in fact, the relationships uh, might surprise you. For example, British English and American English are obviously related. British Sign Language and American Sign Language are not related. In fact, uh, American Sign Language and French Sign Language are related. British Sign Language is totally different. Uh, and it's just because of the history of those languages. They have their, uh, their, their entire own history. Um, anyway, I don't have an accent. Everyone else who doesn't speak like me does. That's, of course, false. We all have an accent. We, we all live with our own unique accent, which makes uh, language a lot of fun. And, of course, there's also the idea that the accent or the dialect that a person speaks reflects their level of education. Uh, also false, but, I mean, this is definitely reinforced uh, by Hollywood. What can, you, what can you do there? But, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, what is this? Oh yeah, I don't need to learn another language. Everybody speaks English, false. Um, it, it, it definitely depends on where you go, and English is certainly kind of a default auxiliary language for many parts of the world. Uh, but of course, it's one of many, many thousands of languages spoken everywhere. Uh, and of course, if they don't speak English, they should, also, also false. I, and by the way, this is kind of a, a pet theory of mine. 
I think as we keep pushing further, like the one, I'm, like the one tiny benefit of AI is that as we keep pushing further with automatic translation, and everybody who's used AirPods, you know, knows how how that works. I think one day we're going to get to a point where we can expect our an AirPod to automatically translate what we're hearing. At which point in time, suddenly a default auxiliary language like English won't be needed. Everybody can just speak whatever language they would like, and it'll be translated. I look forward to that day. I think it'll come anyway. Uh, we, there are hundreds more that we could list. Everybody has misconceptions about what language is and how it works. And the only way to dispel them is just through uh, kind of living, learning, uh, experiencing, studying language. Um, and, you know, it's fun. I, I, I just love studying languages. Uh, I, I will take a moment, for those of you who are undergraduates, if you haven't taken a language course here at the, at the college, you should. Uh, and this is why language courses tend to, uh, they tend to eat up a lot of units. At least they did when I was at Berkeley. They were like, most courses were three and four units. Language courses were five. And the first, the very first course for any language is going to be one of the easiest courses you will ever take. Just, you know, learn, especially take a course that uses a different writing system. Just learn the writing system ahead of time. And I tell you, the first two, three weeks are just going to be mastering that writing system. And so if you have already got it, you can just study ahead while everybody else is trying to figure out how to figure out how to write. And then pretty much you'll just be ahead of the game. It'll be an easy A. And at the end of it, you'll at the very least know how to say, like, where is the bathroom and um, that bus is red, which is a cool thing. Um, anyway, so. Um, what, uh, the problem is that uh, there are many people that present themselves as language experts, and that's not necessarily the case. So here's you know, a big blue circle of speakers of a language. And this orange circle is people claiming to be language experts. And then there's this yellow circle is people who actually are experts. And by the way, this was made very specifically. Jesse made this. I love the placement of this dot. And you can see that the yellow overlaps there. <laughs> there, are some, there are some people who claim to be language experts who are, and some people who don't who are. And then there are many people who do that or not. So you'll often see people who say that, I don't know, they use language well, they're either a poet or an author. Uh, that doesn't necessarily make them a language expert. Um, and you would be surprised at some of the things you hear. I, I, won't, I won't name a name, but there was a famous one down at San Diego who would uh, claim, he made wild claims like the, the English phonology is more accommodating than Japanese, and it's why we can pronounce Kimono is if it's uh, fluent, whereas they can't pronounce English words. Both of those things are false. Anyway, um, so yeah, no oh, wild claims. Oh my goodness. So I can't read this. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> it's <laughs> there is no place where I can place my phone where I can read this. If I put it close, it's too close. If I put it far away, it's too far away. Help me out here, Jess. What do we got? Oh, oh the, my God, is this the... Um, these wait. are the, the tense with the future oh, tense. Oh, it's the tense. Thank you, thank yes. you, thank you. So I don't need to read this. All right, there was a famous... This guy actually had a TED, TED Talk. He put out an article. He was an economist uh, claiming that um, anybody who has an... Uh, what, I, I, I keep mixing up which his claim, but I think his claim was anybody that has obligatory future marking, these uh, people don't save money. Uh, they're more obese, they don't have safe sex, like all this crazy stuff that he was tying to whether their language had obligatory future marking or not, uh, which is an absolutely wild claim, especially when you go in and see what he marked as obligatory future marking and what he didn't. Uh, basically, you'll see claims like this that are often made by non-linguists. Uh, who have kind of like a, a smidge of understanding of what language is, and then will go on to claim things like this. Anyway, this is all just absolute hooey. Um, there's really like nothing you can tie down to show that there's any correlation here if you look at the language facts. Uh, next one, this is Basque, I think. Yeah. You will see this often enough. There are people who will claim these two languages, Basque is supposed to be unrelated to any language in Europe. And here was a claim that it was related to a language of Senegal because he found a couple of words that were similar uh, if you kind of squint your eyes. And so we have uh, senide, which is brother, and then similar to sani day, which of course is not exactly the same 
It's also one of these is two words. They both have entirely different etymologies, but he made the claim that therefore Basque is related to this language of Africa, which is a pretty outlandish claim. Um, I mean, but you find these incidental similarities all over the place. For example, the word uh, for I, the old word for I in Greek is mata, which happens to be identical to the proto Austronesian word for I, mata. Uh, Austronesian is the uh, language family that includes uh, Tagalog, Hawaiian, Samoan, and so on. And so it's like, oh, look, these uh, two words are identical in Greek and in these Austronesian languages. Therefore, they must be similar. Nah, it's just a coincidence. Um, and not a very fun one. Um, and then, of course, uh, movies like Arrival come out where they make pretty wild claims about how language influences our brain. Um, this one went to a, a pretty extreme degree, you know, suggesting that there was time travel. But, um, and, and that was clearly the a fictional part and it was meant to be fiction. But then there was also this part, the so-called nonlinear language of the heptapod aliens, which the, uh, the artist took to mean that, well, you just draw it in a circle, uh, which isn't quite what nonlinear language means. Um, they actually hired a linguist as a consultant for this film. But the linguist was hired to, um, how do I describe this? They, they hired the linguist so that she could tell them like, you know, how does a linguist uh, talk? You know, how do they teach a class? What does a linguist's office look like? And so like the, the office of the linguist, it's just, it, it's, it's really spot on. Um, looks great, but they didn't actually ask her to consult on the language parts, like this part. Like, they didn't ask her to consult on that. And this is a quote from her saying, you know, regarding you know, language, it's like, no, basically that's just art, it's not language, which is true. Um, but they also didn't consult her on the house that she's living in, which every linguist, when you see this movie and you see the house she's living in, just starts laughing, <laughs> especially knowing where she's in, she was at Berkeley. That house would have been like three and a half million dollars. No, not on our salary, sorry. Anyway. Um, so yeah. So that's a good segue because that was a fictional language example and so we definitely we have problems with people claiming they're experts with languages we speak in the in our world naturally uh, and so you can imagine how much more difficult it can be when we talk about languages in fictional worlds where people think anything can go. Quite often when there's a scenario where there are a lot of people where an author or a creator claims that all the people speak some other language other than you know, what's spoken already on earth, English is typically then used to represent the common tongue. And you know, that's a really good option, especially for written media, because if you could imagine reading a novel where any character dialogue could never be in English, but it would be in a language that you would somehow have to learn or would have to be translated after every single piece of dialogue, the reading experience would be kind of awful. And so it makes sense to say, okay, the common tongue is just gonna be represented by English dialogue. And so again, great for written media. It's an easy way out option for visual media. And this is really because producers still think American audiences won't read subtitles. We could totally put subtitles beneath, you know, a constructed language dialogue scene and it happens in some scenes when we do have dialogue in movies and, and films and TV shows. Um, but you'll notice that they pull back at some point and they just go back to speaking English. There's no reason for them to go back to speaking English. And there are scenes in movies where there's like a whole conversation going on in another language. And then as soon as the actor has a really long line, you'll notice they switch to English because they don't want the actor to have to learn it. <laughs> Uh, when two characters who interact with uh, each other on screen or in a book, though, when they're supposed to be speaking different languages, you can't represent them both as English. And so that's when you have to have some other representation in, in there because just having English won't cut it because that doesn't represent the miscommunication or the, the inability to communicate factor of the situation. Unfortunately, it is all too common for people to then just use a natural language, so a language spoken here already that is spoken by communities of speakers, and to say that this is now going to be the language of these other speakers, even though it's supposed to be a language of a fictional world, a language that we've never heard before. Or they'll use gibberish in those situations. 
So we're going to tackle mistake one first, using a natural language to represent another language in a, a book or a film or something of that nature. One problem with it is that it's often cliche and it can border on or even just dive head first right into cultural appropriation, which is, which is really not cool. So as, as one example, a lot of fantasy writers, um, if you look at them in the way that they represent magic and spells and things like that, a lot of them will turn to the Celtic language and say, Celtic, it's a magical language, right? And so, for example, I just did a quick search and I found this on Reddit, this whole thread about Someone who says, is using Celtic culture as a basis for my story cliche? The answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> but in some of the answers, Irish speakers piped up, and I'm just gonna, gonna focus on some of these highlighted parts. Um, one person said, you know what, if you're gonna do it, you're gonna do it, but please, I beg of you, run it past a speaker first, even if it's just names. Um, and so, talking about how to pronounce names, because people will say, and it sounded like this, and then the pronunciation will be totally wrong. Uh, and then, you know, on TV shows, the way they actually pronounce it can be totally wrong. And that, that drives people who actually speak the language a little bit crazy. Uh, another person piped in and says, um, using cultures like the Celtic culture for the aesthetic, when you've done no actual research, is awkward at best and offensive at worst. That's the truth. It ends up portraying Gaelic languages as fantastical and unreal props and not languages with living, breathing communities of speakers. And so again, like if it's supposed to be a magical language, why not create it? Why not have something new and fantastical that, that could support your world instead of taking something from an existing culture? Another person points out, um, if you've seen Merlin on BBC, there is apparently a scene with Morgana who uses a snake as a prop. Um, and the word is spelled N-A-T-H-A-I-R in the Gaelic language, in the Celtic language. And they pronounce it on screen as Nathair, as it would be in English. Well, that is not at all right. It should be Nahur. And so it's totally wrong pronunciation. And so they drew this, this metaphor saying it would be like a foreign writer inventing a new species of magical bird-like creatures and calling it a chicken, but pronouncing it chiskin. <laughs> <laughs> and now I want to see a chiskin. <laughs> yeah, at least Simba, which means lion, at least they got pretty close to the pronunciation. <laughs> that is true. Uh, so using a natling, sort of others speakers of that language, it essentially says, we understand English, which is the common tongue. If you speak this other language, you're odd, you're different, you're other. And so it really sets it apart instead of making a more inclusive area. Another example is from Chronicles of Narnia, specifically introduced in The Horse and His Boy. The Kalorman region is blatantly Middle Eastern. And so these are some images that came from one of the, one of the editions of the book. Uh, character names include things like Tash, Tizrak, Rabadash, Emeth, and the Tarkins. There's also a vizier, so there's like very much this um, Arabic and Middle Eastern sort of influence in the naming practices. Place names, Zalindre, Tashban, Azimbalda, Tahishban. Uh, these are all place names uh, in the region. And you can see in the images, they are described as people who wear turbans, have slightly darker skin, um, you know, they have the, the head wrapping, they've got pointy shoes, so it's like really a lot of stereotypes that you probably may think of like Arabic or Arabian influences, and now I'm thinking about Aladdin. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and so uh, it was really based heavily on the Middle Eastern region, and as you may be able to see from the pictures, they were not nice people. Yeah, and it was, uh, it was definitely intentional at that time because you could say, well, it was a different era. And, it, and honestly, I saw it described as one commentator as essentially accurate. That is, at that era, it was considered just fun to make fun of other cultures. And now we feel like we can do a little bit better. And yet we you'll still we see this type of thing in, in books like, okay, you know what? I pick on Lee because she's my friend, but I swear in Shadow and Bone, there's a character because uh, a, a lot of it was, this was heavily Russian influenced. There's a character whose name is P-R-I-V-E-T, which if you studied Russian, one of the ways to say hello is Privet, which is, that's how it's spelt. 
but of course, uh, the character's name was pronounced Prevet um, because uh, she didn't know that. And so it was like she named the character Hello, but kind of mispronounced Hello. Um, <laughs> named so, her Hello. <laughs> anyway, so uh, gibberish actually, uh, uh, you'll see at the end, gibberish does have a place. Gibberish does have a place. But um, the audience is going to pick up on it uh, pretty quickly because, uh, you know, at best it's mildly entertaining. At, at worst, it's kind of embarrassing and it's distracting. And really for, uh, for creators, for authors, for filmmakers, it's that last point that's most important. It's distracting. And you don't want people thinking about what you're showing them. You want them to be engaged in what you're showing them or reading. So this one's a book. Um, and this one, this is all Jesse's work. Uh, this is an, off, uh, an Alice Hoffman book called Story Sisters. And she created a language in her book. And this isn't the sum total of it. This is some of it. This is just some of it. All right, so here are some examples. You can kind of read through them. There's the language on the left. Uh, there is the English on the right. We're going to highlight some of the words in both columns. So these are just first person singular pronouns of one kind or another. And you can see how they're reified. So in in the first sentence here, right, uh, actually in the first three, these are all subjects. So it's all, I do something. I came, I feel, I hate. And you can see there's three different rep representations. One of them, there's it's essentially pro derop, like in Spanish, where you don't need to include the first person pronoun. The next one, it's me, which clearly comes from somewhere. The next one is je, which looks like it comes from French. And then we have my there, which is nom, and then me is malin, and, you, and you'll see why it has to be malin uh, later. Uh, but there's basically absolutely no consistency to this whatsoever. It couldn't be, it's not like it couldn't be language. This couldn't be the same language. That's the, that's the important part. And then here's you, some other ones with, there's just, it's all over the board. Even in the same sentence, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> wow. Yep. Um, and by the way, this is, uh, these are the words for rescue, so this is why we know that Malin has to be something like me uh, in that sentence, because there's already something. You can even kind of vaguely see maybe there's some sort of a pattern here, but the problem is nothing resolves to anything in this language. And so when you're reading the book, it's like if you pay attention to this even a little bit, it's like, wait a minute, that isn't right. And so it's just, why is it even there? It's just a distraction. Uh, and then, of course, all too often, the uh, gibberish is just a, a total uh, cultural stereotype and sometimes just downright offensive. This one really jumped out to me. Uh, I, I really thought the, pirates, the first Pirates of the Caribbean was fun. The second one begins with this scene where Jack Sparrow has been captured by natives who are cannibals. And then there's this entire scene of him like uh, speaking with them, just doing absolute gibberish. Uh, and it's just, ooh. Like that was, this is pretty late in the game. I'm, I'm still wondering how that made it to the screen. Anyway, um, the gibberish is also often repetitive in a non-natural way. And for anybody who's like, you know, because uh, we all do this, especially as kids, if there's actually patterns to gibberish. Uh, and it's pretty interesting for uh, linguists who study gibberish and different types of vocalizations, because gibberish will sound different depending on your native language. They do this with babbling, too, for, for babies. So uh, babies just kind of babble, right? They just wordless communication before they can speak. Babbling sounds different in different language. it's, languages. It's really fascinating. Anyway, so Star Wars uh, Return of the Jedi, this is my... Uh, favorite example, the so-called language uh, UVs. You have um, Princess Leia, who basically says like the same word three times. She's essentially saying, yate, yate, yoto. And it's being translated as radically different things. And they put the subtitles down there. So it's like you can check it. And, and C-3PO is supposed to be translating. And it's like the, um, the subtitles, uh, it's like those are supposed to be outside of the fiction of the universe. So it's like they're, they're supposed to be breaking the fourth wall. They're supposed to be real. And it's like at one point in time, you know, Yoto means 50,000. Another time it means like, you know, I have the Wookiee. And another time it means I have a thermal detonator. 
It, it's just, uh, it, it's really distracting. It's something that anybody can pick up on because it's there on the screen and that's really all that language is. It's just basically, if it's for a spoken language, if you hear it, that's it. That's the language. It's not like it's, it's like a prop where it looks real on stage, uh, but if you go and look at it up close, it's something different. Language is basically its presentation. That is all of it. Anyway, so gibberish is pretty uninteresting for a fan base, and it comes across as silly, even in serious situations. Uh, and it's interesting to note, uh, some people don't know this, but the Game of Thrones producers actually originally planned to use gibberish for Dothraki. And in fact, they used this in the, uh, in the auditions for the actors. They said like, well, uh, we just kind of wrote some gibberish in here for the Dothraki, and you can just kind of do whatever you want in their auditions. But the gibberish that these actors were doing was so laughably bad that they realized that their only option was to actually create an entire language. And so they did. Um, sometimes, though, uh, the silliness of gibberish is warranted. And this is my favorite example. So anybody, if you remember Lilo and Stitch uh, at the beginning, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a goofy movie. It's a fun movie. It's a kid's movie. And so there's uh, most of the time the aliens are speaking English. There's one scene where, oh, and these are out of order. Um, there, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump ahead. Um, there's uh, one scene where, okay, here is Stitch, and Stitch is being put on trial, and Stitch is being asked by this you know, head judge like, to basically defend his existence, to say like, I'm giving you one opportunity to say something that is going to defend your entire existence as a being. And Stitch says something in gibberish that's not subtitled, which is apparently so offensive that it causes this robot, oops, sorry. Oh, well, GIF isn't working. Come on, GIF. There, there we go. go. It causes this robot to throw up its own cogs, which doesn't even make sense. And so the thing is, whatever they could have put in a subtitle is not going to be as bad as what you might imagine. It was really, really important that the audience, I think, not understand what was being said at this point. That there not be like, you know, further examples of the gibberish, so you go back and work out the language and figure out what he said. It's not gonna be as funny as if you don't understand what he said at all. So this was a good example of, of gibberish. So it does, it does have a place sometimes. Anyway. Oop. Yep. Well, I just went, there we go. Um, so in general, the best, option is to actually use a conlang because a good conlang can make a world fuller and more realistic. And so for example, if you're watching a TV show and the characters walk into a busy marketplace, actually hearing the language of the area just being shouted or spoken and, and just bits around them is really, it really makes it feel like they're in a different area. Um, seeing the language also helps, and so this is uh, a screenshot from Shadow and Bone Season 2 when they're in the Shu region, and they're in uh, one of the major port cities, and you can see the writing up here, that's the Shu language um, writing system, which, uh, well, as someone we know actually created that for us, we created the Shu language. Um, and so you can see it throughout the marketplace on balloons, on signs, on lanterns, on, on things like this. And it really makes it, again, more believable that they're in this other area. If you listen carefully as they're walking through marketplaces, you may hear people in the background say things like, oh, le that fish is good. One lira o how much for this? Lowe eyal, please take one. And then we have these two that are idiomatic, the I'm sorry and thank you. We created these as idiomatic expressions in the language, both of which, if you literally define them, have iwasesh in them, which means my heart. And so gan iwasesh and ben iwasesh are I'm sorry and thank you. Yavon mesper, the, the boat has now arrived. Pomweme, move it. And dishom dirariv, where is the tea shop? So these are all things you may hear people in the background, not the main characters, not the people we're focusing on, just the people that are around them, they're saying these kinds of things as they move throughout the marketplace and the port. Seeing language on props, like you did in that marketplace, uh, creates a more believable space. And so, for instance, in Elemental, 
um, where they were supposed to be in the fire part of the, the city. And so fire town, I think, is what they, they actually called it. Um, there's a lot of what would be the common language, which is, again, represented as English. But then there's also mixed into it the Fireish language, Tsitsash, which David and I created. And so here you can see, you may be able to see like fire sparks and fire starters and different things in English on the shelf. But she's reaching for a bottle of something, and it's in a different language. And that's the writing system we created specifically for the fire language. And so you see this mix, and it's just very naturally presented, just like it would be if you were to walk into um, a shop where they, they sell things from other countries. Um, as you're walking down the street, we couldn't get a, a really good screen grab of this particular um, idea. This is just as you're entering Firetown. And so you've got some like Gusty City and some other things from the air part of the city. But you can see the sign on that part over here on the right. And that is one of the glyphs from our, our writing system for the language. And so what will happen is like as Ember, the main character, is riding through the streets of Firetown, look at this, the signs. You'll see a lot of this, this writing system on the signage um, in the area. And again, it just creates a more believable space, even in a cartoon. Vampire Academy did, I think, one of the best jobs I've seen of, of incorporating um, the, the writing system into the props. And so, for instance, um, on the gravestone here, you've got the name in both writing systems, the English, um, the, the common language, and then in Ajnamari. And then you can just see it in um, like backgrounds of, of scenes, on costumes. You can see the writing system. This is all translated into the language. Um, running across the newspaper, you've got this uh, through gale in rain across canyon and amid flames kind of theme for the newspaper. You've got that running across the top, again, in the actual language, Ajnamari. Pages and pages of text in the language. And so these are all props that make the whole world more believable. Yeah, it can kind of like, it kind of like can make meaningful, uh, uh, can meaningfully connect the language in the fictional world. So we have uh, some of these in Jacobsa and Dune. Um, we had some fun ones. So uh, Safadla, this is uh, the Fremen language. So Safadla is how you say hello, and it comes from an expression that means, uh, to, oh, okay, okay, you know, it's kind of like to get peace, right? Yeah, like take yeah. it, yeah. Oh, yes, take peace. Oh, yeah, that, that's, so that would be hello, goodbye. Saya uh, lehiz would be walk safely. That's a good one. Um, this was, this was yours, right? Yeah. That's right. Okay, so Jesse came up with this one. So, uh, which is life is better with friends, which is literally, it is dry, but for friends. I think that's nice. Um, this is in here, if you've never seen Dune, the reason yeah, yeah. the metaphor, this idiomatic expression was it's dry, but for friends, is they're in the middle of a desert. Right. And, and that only makes sense if you know that. <laughs> That's right. Okay, there we go. Right, Dune. Uh, so uh, with Vampire Academy, that was the one that we were we were just showing you some scenes of. We also have uh, some cool expressions like, uh, oh my goodness, uh, this is going to be our Monzon ou Lulechida, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Is your bloodline royal? Is a way that you can greet people because there's this whole mythology in the Vampire Academy universe about bloodlines and the uh, and the royalty in there and it's kind of like makes a really big difference you know who you are another one is that they have this kind of elemental magic and so one of their common expressions is uh, in the name of the elements uh, it's kind of like a conlang can build character so we have some key phrases, and so this is it's ash, uh, to show familial collection and kind of a shared cultural history. Uh, so these show up, actually. So ashfa is the word for father. That shows up. Uh, bakso, that one shows up. Uh, it, it's kind of the important climax of the movie. Um, oh, that's a, that's a cool word for a coal nut. So that's kaipo. Uh, coal nut is kind of like these, um, these special uh, food that the fire people make. That, play, that plays a key role in the movie. Um, the language that we created for uh, Elemental was designed to sound like fire to reflect the characters. 
Uh, Kotlin can also be used to like name characters and places in a consistent manner. So most of the stuff I did for Raya and the Last Dragon didn't show up, but I created all these names. So Raya, for example, uh, Namari, her friend, which means, oh shoot, what does Namari mean? It means it's something like to cut one's heart because it has to do with sacrifice. That was it. Sisu, which means, uh, which is uh, the name of the dragon. Uh, Kumandra, of course, which is also, it means heartland. Is it? I don't remember. Anyway, it's been a while since that one. Uh, a Conlang can support interactions where people would not speak the same language. So defiance is probably the best example of this. So I created four different languages, each with four different writing systems. And the languages were used everywhere. Not only that, they were used when people were speaking English. There were the, so like there would be borrowings from the alien languages into English. There were borrowings from English into the alien languages. It was a really, really, really fun project. So this is the main cast. Um, Oh, I have a fun story about this, but anyway, you can see some of the writing in the background there. Um, a conlang in general should not be based on a real world language unless there's a reason to do so. For example, in the hundred, tree get a slang is actually the English language if it evolved in that fictional universe, like 150 years from now, 100 years after uh, this catastrophic series of nuclear explosions that, that killed almost everybody on the planet. So it's a, it is an actual form of English. Uh, it's not like, because it was, the 100 was set in America 150 years from now. So it's not as if I should be hired to create some brand new language that never existed and had no connection to anything because it's actually supposed to be the real world. Um, so that's usually the, the only time where you have a connection between a real world language and a con lang. And so, we're going to transition into talking about uh, conlangs, conlanging, and translation in broader senses. Uh, as more conlangs appear in media, so they're becoming uh, much more common, it's becoming more mainstream. Uh, however, there are still a lot of misconceptions about what it is that we do, and we see a lot of these um, in requests we get from people who hire us. And some of them have to do with uh, their perception of how language works um, and how it could be described. So some words that have been used to describe language when we've been hired for projects where they say, we want the language to sound, and we've heard things like guttural, melodic, flowing, rigid, strong, comforting, linguistical. <laughs> if you know what linguistical means, please enlighten us because we are still baffled as to what that may mean. Um, and so these are the kinds of things that people will say, and often they will contrast them. They'll say something like, we want it to be guttural yet melodic, and so we're not entirely sure what they mean by that. Are there particular sounds they want in the language that they think are guttural? What does melodic mean to them? Uh, do they want a stress system, I guess, with you know rhythmic stress? It's really, really questionable what they mean, but we're, we have to figure that out and kind of, kind of run with it and do our own thing from there. We also get this a lot. We don't need a full language. What they're really saying is we don't want to pay you. We don't need a full language. We just need a couple lines of translation. It's really impossible to do any lines of translation without a full system to support it. So if you need a sentence, you need a language, you need a grammar, you need a system. There are naming languages, which you just create basically a sketch or an outline of a language that you can fill out later if you need it. But all you really use the language for, if it's a naming language, is making names, like place names, character names, and so on. You don't really do anything else with it. Um, and so, for example, we worked on a project where the author only needed names. And so they didn't need a full language. They just needed this outline to make it into a consistent, cohesive kind of system. And so some examples from that work include Feocose, which means people's world, Rei Melina, Many Rocks, and Limatiesu, City of Echoes. And so if anyone were to analyze what's going on in the names, they'll notice modifiers appear in the same place every time there's a name. Um, the, the sort of uh, prefixes and suffixes that appear, appear regularly when you're supposed to see it in that kind of name. And so it creates, again, this cons consistency and cohesiveness. As soon as you need a clause, as soon as you need a verb in there, you need a grammar, which means you need a full language. We also get this a lot once we're actually working on a job. We're sending a quick line for translation. It's small, so it'll be easy. Don't worry about it. 
Um, but I'll tell you what, some of the small lines we get are some of the hardest work that we end up doing. Um, so something like, for example, watch it, a line from Elemental. Um, it sounds really easy, but when you think about it, it doesn't really make sense because it's very idiomatic. It makes sense in the context of saying, here's a movie, watch it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Now it literally means watch it. But what you're actually saying when you yell to somebody, watch it, like in a, in a situation, in a regular situation outside of that context, you're telling them to be careful, you're telling them I'm here, you're telling them you know, all these little pieces of information, languages aren't going to all use this same word. So it didn't make sense for us to just create a verb for watch, put it with it, and say, done, watch it. Um, instead, we came up with paururha, which literally means, here I burn, I spit fire. <laughs> and so here we've got, um, here I burn. In other words, I exist. This is our way of doing like to be verbs. And so it's saying, I, I'm here, I'm existing here. And then this I spit fire became reduced to an exclamation, where it's just, you just put it on something when you want to be like, hey. And so the far'ur, I'm here. And ha, hey, watch it. And so in other words, it was our version of the, I'm walking here. And so that, that was that short one. For motherland Fort Salem, we had this line, none taken which first out of context means nothing. What was taken, what wasn't taken, what's the none? Um, but here, what it was meant to be was no offense was taken. Again, very idiomatic. And so we ended up translating that into Meniche as Yawi Zain, and that literally breaks down to I, it, not, am aware of, in that order, because of the word order of the language, um, where we have um, it is just a generic third person, so it doesn't really stand for anything. In other words, it's like, there's something you think I should know, but I don't know it. And so altogether it means, I'm not aware of any offense, so it's okay. And finally, another example of that is the line, keep an eye out from Dune, the second Dune, which is coming out in November, um, which we translated, again, very idiomatic. And so we translated that as Yohesia, and um, Yohesia breaks down to um, a prefix meaning repeatedly, I see. And the repeatedly, um, or repeatedly see. Repeatedly actually comes from the verb yoha, meaning to echo. So it's essentially like saying to somebody, well, watch it repeatedly, so that way you're maintaining vigilance. Um, and so again, all of these examples, very short lines, but we had to do a lot of creative thinking and a lot of ways of thinking about the world and how does this actually fit in with the world to make it make sense. This is, uh, this is another th uh, sometimes thing. Well, we want to like write a single word, but we don't necessarily need a full orthography. So we, we thought of a nice example, and actually this is a good analogy for language too, where it's just like, oh, we want to say a few words, but we don't need a full language. Um, there is a, a show that is very near and dear to my heart that uh, my sister and I kind of started watching during the pandemic and kept us going. Uh, Murder, She Wrote, absolutely wonderful show, 12 seasons. Angela Lansbury was nominated for Best Actress 12 seasons in a row. Emmy for Best Actress, 12 seasons in a row, and she lost every single time. Can't believe it. Anyway, so there's this font, very particular font, the Murder, She Wrote font. All right, and you might think, well, it's like, okay, we, if you're talking to an, uh, an art department, it's like, well, we, needed to, we need to say murder she wrote in this font, but we don't need a full font. But that's a bit short-sighted because, well, it's like, all right, you've got those two up there, but it's, those aren't the only things that you ever write on the show because there are guest actors who will, of course, have different letters in their name. They also do the uh, name of the episodes in this font. And so it's like, no, you don't just need the letters that are in Murder, She Wrote and Angela Lansbury. And it'd be kind of absurd to say, hey, we just want to pay you for part of a font, just those letters, and that's it. Um, because, you know, ultimately throughout the entire run of the show, they used every single letter, upper and lower case. Uh, and so it's like, well, why don't you just pay for the entire font? Exactly. Anyway, so uh, the another thing that we deal with is that writing and orthography is the same as writing a language and so this happens a lot now 
there's two different things I want to mention. So like when you're talking about a writing system used on a show, there's background stuff where it's just like, all right, nobody's going to be able to read this, you know, like right now there, there was like off in the wings over there, there was a little sign that says something. There's no way I could read it. So you can imagine if this were some sort of a, a movie or a television show from my perspective, we wouldn't need real writing on that sign if it was just a prop. But if it's going to be in focus like this, you would hope that they would ask us to translate it into something real. Like you could see the big letters, you can't see the little ones. So the little stuff can be lorem ipsum. But you know, you want uh, to be able to actually do it. So um, they will often say that, you know, just give us the font and you don't need us to do anything. But then mistakes like this happen. So there is a, this is a map on Shadow and Bone. This is a place called Bez Ju which is a, a name of a city, and, and Lee came up with it, and she wrote it um, in Roman letters like this with an H, um, because she just threw an H in there. there. The H serves absolutely no purpose. And so, of course, when you actually write it, we just get rid of the H. We just do the pronunciation because the H is there for silly reasons. And this, is, this by the way, is uh, what the name of that city means. It's kind of like good salt water. And that's how you actually spell it. You get rid of the H, you get B-E-Z-J-U. Uh, but the problem is that they use the book spelling because they never checked it with us, as opposed to the real spelling. Uh, and, and of course, they also only used half of the city name. I don't know why they did that. Anyway, consequently, the actual ligature, ligature didn't work. So this is how you would write Bez, right? And you can see it's supposed to be stacked just like that. And then here's the next part of the city name, and it stacks just like that. What they did was they wrote B-H-E-Z. And so the B just hung out there, and then the H got thrown up there and went E-Z. And so instead of it looking like that, it looked like that, where there's just this random B there. It's like it, it literally says B has. And it's just like, it was so simple. They could have just asked us for it, but they didn't. Anyway, so, oh, this is me too, mm -hmm. right, all right. But every so often, the stars align and something comes out that's, that's really pretty good. So, uh, we've got the, this scene from Game of Thrones. Uh, it was the fourth episode of the third season, um, and uh, I wanted to focus on this particular line, a dragon is not a slave. So, uh, in order to translate that line, we, this is in High Valyrian. Dohai Ragon means to serve. Dohai Rigon with an E means to serve habitually. And so Dohai Rire would be serving habitually. It's a, what do you call that? Uh, participle. It's a participle. Oh, Dohai Rire. That's what you were going for. Participle. Okay. That's what is it. That's what it is. And then so uh, creating a normalization of that, Dohai Riros would be one who serves habitually, which is the word for a servitor or slave in High Valyrian. So, the translation would ordinarily be except that I changed it because I had kind of the authority to translate things as I would. So knowing the story and how this goes, you have Daenerys, who is this uh, uh, usurped queen from a distant land who's in another place. And she wishes, she needs an army. So she wants to buy this army, and this army is an army of slaves from this guy who owns the army, and she is going to trade a dragon for this army. Now, in the history of the language of High Valyrian, it has this relationship, so that's the High Valyrian is related to Astaporia Valyrian, which is the language that um, this guy speaks. So he speaks Astaporia Valyrian, she speaks High Valyrian, and it has the same relationship that Latin has with Old Spanish. So it's like, there is uh, Valeria, where she's from. There is Astapor, where he's from. And in the history of this world, the Valerians came and conquered Astapor and implanted their language many centuries ago. And so they speak a descendant version of the language. Uh, consequently, there's this Giscari substrate, which is the language that used to be in Geese, where Astapor is. There's a Giscari substrate that was added to High Valyrian, and from that descended the language Astaporia Valyrian. 
So I decided to swap out the, uh, the by the way, these are the two different words. So Dohairi uh, Roz is Valerian for uh, slave. Buzdari is the Giscari word. I decided to have her swap out the high Valerian word for the Astapori word for this reason. Up until this point, he assumed that she didn't speak his language, and so he employed a translator to speak to her in English, assuming that she didn't speak any Valyrian. And so she kind of played this up, up to this point where she says the line, a dragon is not a slave. And this is how she reveals to him that she speaks Valyrian. And so I decided it would be more appropriate if not only does she reveal it by using high Valyrian, she takes the Giscari word and uses it to imply that not only does she speak Valyrian, she understood his particular variety of Valyrian, including all of the ways that he has been insulting her through all the way through all the other episodes up to that point. All right, so here is the scene. I'm going to start playing it, and I'm going to hope that the audio goes, because sometimes it works with HDMI, and sometimes it doesn't. So let's see what happens and also see what volume it's at, if it's working. Nah, I don't hear anything. You have to change the audio settings on your computer. What? You have to change the audio settings on your computer for output. Really? It's the HDMI. I don't think so. I think it's, I think it's something down there. Can we get, uh, you serious? All right. Give me one second. It's a really cool example, though. I don't think that's. Oh. By the way, this is my old elementary school. It's a historic building in Owensville, right Missouri. Here. OK. I'm originally from Missouri. And now sound. Where's, where's sound? And after this video, by the way, this will, this will be the ending. Yeah, so be thinking of your questions. Yeah. We will have time for uh, an question HDMI and too. answer. And we very much look forward to answering any questions okay, you may well, have. OK, so external headphones should be what, what it does, though. All right, so, uh, but I, I have no idea what volume it'll be at, though. So let's get ready. All right, you ready? Yeah. Woo! All right, ready? There we go. Done then. They belong to me. Pindas Lusa Sertida. Sertida. This is done. You hold the whip. Sparrows is the uh, the Azantia. Zadrizes Buzdaris Gosdaur. Zadrizes Valire. Nigay Diner is Jel Masmo and Targaryo Lentrot. And Valeria Wipoanagar Exan. Valeria Munuengos Nuhis Isa. Dovagadi. Axios and Das, Mentios and 
Anyway, so uh, that is what we had for you today. So thank you very much. And um, oh, this is just the word thank you in a bunch of languages that we've done. Um, and do you want to go ahead and go to the last screen? Go for it. And there we go. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us or follow us on social media um, or find helpful links that we have posted, uh, these QR codes will take you to our link tree pages. Um, where all those links uh, will be there. And so you can find it there. You can scan it with your phone and go, go directly to the site. Yeah. And yeah, we'll now use the questions. rest of the time for questions. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, there, there, by the way, there's a microphone. There are a couple of microphones floating around. So please get their attention. Uh, and then we will answer whoever has a microphone. Okay. Um, I was wondering if like, so I, I don't know how to phrase this without sounding a little crass, but I was wondering, um, do you, when, when someone comes to you and asks, okay, we need you, we would like you to design a language for us, do you have different rates that you charge them based on like the, the different medium they're working with or like their financial background or do you have a set rate that you work with? Because it seems like something that would be a, a bit of a, an interesting dilemma to account for. I mean honestly it's, it's based on the amount of work and what, and what we have available because of course uh, especially like if you're talking about somebody with like, you know, say like a really small budget, say they're a new author that's just starting out. Um, it's not like we're the only language creators. There are thousands of people who create languages and tons who would uh, love the opportunity to do something like that. So it's like uh, for a smaller job, if, if we don't have the time or we don't think that, or, or we need to devote that time to something else, then we just uh, point them towards the uh, Language Creation Society's Jobs Board, which is a place where anybody can put up a job to say, like, I want a language created or an orthography created, and then um, can put it out. And th that can be for smaller jobs, uh, but as well as, as some larger ones. Uh, so generally, oops, sorry, generally that's, that's how we do it. Thank you. Sure. Hello. Hi. Um, my question was, if you're creating a language like um, Shu in um, Shadow and Bone that is based off of um, certain cultures, um, oh, yeah. like in the way that they dress and present themselves and such, is there a way that you go about that more than um, a very more like fantasy language um, based on the different kind of starting points? So first of all, uh, with, with that one specifically, so I was friends with Lee, so I was like, it was nice to be able to text her and be like, you know, what were you thinking? But like, with, what we try to do is to create something that is going to be internally consistent that isn't necessarily based on anything. And in fact, for the grammar of Shu, uh, Jesse did the lion's share of that. Yeah, that was um, very, very difficult because there were so many Shu lines. Um, Gosh, uh, that sorry, we needed to, to break down. And one of our, our very specific goals was to make it less like any language than it had been presented. Mm -hmm. And so really we wanted it to be more like accidental in the way that, okay, a lot of these are monosyllabic and a lot of them are, are presented in a particular way. And so we, we did our best to say, well, here's what's in the book, but the dialogue, of course, is gonna be different you know, from what's in the show. And, uh, but we did remain faithful to what she had there while also turning 
um, some just words that are presented into very complex compounds and um, doing a, a lot of different things with that. So we, as much as possible, because we do work with a lot of, um, when we do have work existing in books, a lot of times they are based on a language. Like in Dune, a lot of it was based on Arabic um, yeah. and other Semitic languages. Um, in Shadow and Bone, yeah, there was some obvious inspiration from existing languages. And our job is to make it less like that and make it its own thing where you end up being able to translate it in completely different ways. Um, and it makes it very difficult, which is why we always prefer when there's no source material, because then we get to start with what we want. It's always, always harder when we have the source material and have to figure out how to you know, back, back channel, work it all into a system that is totally different from what it's being presented as. Yeah, Shu especially is really interesting. Like I can't, like with the grammar, I can't think of anything it's super like, you know? It's, yeah, it, it was a difficult project. And there were um, really some issues where um, the first edition of the book had one translation, and then the second and beyond editions had a completely different line of translation. Oh, God, yeah. And so, yeah, we had to do a lot of work with Lee Bardugo just to say which of these should be, you know, the, the canon, <laughs> which of these should we use. And um, there was also a line that just wasn't translated at all, and we needed mm. to figure out what that meant. And so, yeah, there was a. It was a lot of work. Yeah. I have a question about the process itself. So I know in Spanish, like, you use, like, tú or usted, mm -hmm. uh, depending on formality. In the Game of Thrones, did y'all incorporate this in the writing process? Because, you know, the soldiers have a master, and there's that hier hierarchical structure a lot in the movie. So uh, there is uh, not necessarily, so, you know, all languages, you can be formal or informal in any language. Uh, not every language is going to have that tied to the pronoun system. Formality will be expressed in a variety of different ways. And sometimes that, uh, the way that it's expressed in one language, like the formal version in one language, will be the informal version in another language. Um, so like... Uh, with High Valerian, no, there isn't any. Well, we, that, by the way, in linguistics, that's called a TV distinction. Uh, and no, in High Valerian, there isn't a TV distinction. There, are, there also isn't an Astapori Valerian. There isn't a Thraki. Um, it's a little odd, honestly. But, um, but no, there isn't one in High Valerian. Uh, because, and it's just, it's not as if, and this is why. Essentially, whatever you see in a culture, it's not as if it is going to be hard-coded into the language or vice versa. Uh, that is, in terms of grammaticality, sometimes there is no relationship. Um, so, so yeah, no, that distinction doesn't show up in, in the Valerian languages. Um, that's not something that we do a lot no. uh, in, in the pronouns, I think. Uh, but that's par uh, partially a uh, personal preference. Uh, I like very simple pronoun systems, so it's like no gender distinction, just one, two, and three. Um, it makes things nice and clean, you don't have to worry about it. Um, yeah, I don't know, so like the place where you see, the place where you see culture manifesting itself is, uh, you know, in kind of like a, a minimal to moderate way in the words that are there, in other words, that they will, there will be words for things that exist in that culture and not words for things that don't exist, or they'll be borrowed in. Uh, and then the place where you see it show up is in the idioms, uh, the, the types of expressions that exist uh, in the language and what they mean. Um, like, for example, in, um, in Dothraki, there's, uh, there is an expression uh, to do something, torga uh, eshya, uh, right? I think that's it. It's to do it under a roof, and it means to do it in secret. And this was based on the, the, the cultural idea that in Dothraki, things of, that of, of great importance are done under the open sky. And so if you do something under a roof, uh, it means like you're doing it in secret. So it's kind of like behind somebody's back, um, except the expression is under a roof. And it doesn't really make any sense outside of Dothraki culture. Uh, it's just kind of a cool little thing. But culture doesn't really play a crucial role in determining the grammar of a language. It's just something that happens. OK, thank you. Sure. Hey, oh, sorry. Oh, I also yes. have a question. Um, what drove you to get into the creation of languages? Oh. oh. 
that's a, kind of a different thing for, for both of us. Um, in my case, I thought it was fun. So when I was taking my very first linguistics class at uh, University of Berkeley, um, I had been missing studying languages because the year prior I had taken Arabic and Russian and Esperanto, and then I took French. Um, but I had to give up the study of, of Arabic and Russian because the next course of Arabic was offered at nine in the morning and the next course of Russian was offered at eight in the morning. So my only choice was to not study those languages anymore because <laughs> there was really no other choice. And so I was missing those. And so like, as I was taking my linguistics course, I was like, man, what if I created my own language? But instead of Esperanto, which was for international communication, what if I just created it for fun, using all the stuff that I love? And so that was it. Once I, I had that thought, I immediately started creating languages. And that was 23 years ago. Um, it's continued to be fun. And I actually had two different starts, because when I was a kid, I attempted my first creation of a language. Um, but I didn't understand how language worked at the time. So really, what I was doing was creating a code of English. And so it was just a code. Um, but it was because I wanted a secret language with my friends. I thought that was the coolest thing ever, and none of my friends did, so I did all this work and was ready to teach them all, and then they weren't interested. So that project went by the wayside. Um, and then, so that's sort of like the first start of it. Uh, went a long time, did a lot of schoolwork, a lot of studies, majored in linguistics, got a degree in linguistics, um, and so I learned all the language bits that I needed to know. And it was actually while I was working on my dissertation for my PhD. And it was just, it was all the research and all of the, the sort of minute details you have to pay attention to in academic writing were just like absolutely draining my mental energy. And so I needed something creative. I needed a creative outlet. And so I created a language because it was like, oh yeah, there was this thing I did when I was a kid and I loved it. But now I actually have the knowledge. Why not try it again? And so I did. Thank you. When you're making a new language, do you always preset the uh, subject, object, verb order, or is it more malleable? Uh, so usually, actually the place where we start is the ordering of a, two nouns and deciding which one is going to be the modifier. Then we go from there. Next point is going to be deciding which side of the verb the object is going to be on or actually probably whether it's going to be a uh, nominative accusative language or ergative absolutive or something in between. Uh, so you can figure out you know, which side which thing is going to be on. Um, so then, uh, yeah, deciding you know, object and verb or absolutive and verb. Or is it ergative and verb for those? No. Well, no, the wait, ergative wait. is, is, is absolute, you know. And, and so deciding what order those are going to be in and then building out from there. Now, we also generally have an idea at the beginning, like what kind of a language do we want to do? Do we want to do one that's more isolational? Do we, or do we want to do one that's more analytic, more agglutinative? And it's based kind of like on what feels fun, what we're interested in, uh, what we haven't done in a while, and then just kind of building out to support it. And then it's like, as you start to build out and do other things, like the orders of you know, adpositional phrases and also relative clauses and, and questions and things like that, it's based on what makes sense, starting with what you started with. Um, so it's really kind of like starting there, trying to start as small as possible and building out uh, in a way that makes sense for the language as it's growing. What would you say the best way to learn a language is? Is there like a set, objective, uh, best way to go about the process, or does it kind of vary? If you really want to learn a language, you've got to work with it every single day. And there's like no like shortcut or anything. You just have to use the darn language every single day. I mean, sure, the best way is going to be like abs get absolutely fluent input and listen to it as much as you can, you know, go to the country, talk to people, have people talking to you, but that's expensive and it takes a lot of time. So and it's like you just kind of, as a, as a working adult, you just have to try to get around it, you know, using Duolingo, taking classes. Well, like, the best way is sometimes what you have available to you that you're willing to commit to. 
And so, yeah, the best way is to be immersed, go, go to where they speak the language, drop yourself in, and have to exist in the language. That is absolutely, nothing's going to beat that. But short of being able to do that, the best way is what you're going to keep up with. And having classes that are offered that you can actually be in and take and have that input, let me tell you, when that's no longer available to you, you're going to miss it. Uh, uh -huh. That's an amazing way. And so after that, it's, you know, we use Duolingo because it's what we have available and what we are committed to. 300-day streaks go in, and, yeah. you know, it, it's what we're willing and able to do. And so it's what you're going to stick with is going to be the best way. And then when you get the opportunities, take them because, yeah, any opportunities to learn any amount of language are going to help your, your overall exposure. Yeah. Um, I think we're probably going to have to uh, cut it uh, short now, but we're going to be here the next couple of days. If you have other questions, come and find us. We'll be around.